Good morning. Sorry to be a little late, but it's always nice to come, come out here and see people who are actually smiling. Um, I'm Jack Klieger, um, President and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, Living Memorial to Holocaust, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our first keynote event of today's inaugural New York Jewish Book Festival. Um, this keynote is on Daniel Gross's book, Banker's Journey, How Edmund J. Safra Built the Global Financial Empire. Edmund J. Safra is, of course, the person who this theater is named after. Uh, we hope you'll explore 32 events that are happening throughout the museum today, um, meet some of the 85 speakers, and uh, get books signed at one of the 72 author signings in our main lobby and events hall on the second floor. For those of you joining via live stream, there are six more keynote events today. You can find the schedule at nyjewishbookfestival.org and purchase the books at mjhnyc.org slash shop. Let me also just thank our head of marketing communications, Joshua Mack, and head of programming, um, and his whole team, but uh, particularly um, um, our, 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 the team that he has put together. Um, so we hope you'll enjoy yourselves today, um, um, and, and particularly on the way out, if you can all um, see Gabriel Saunders, who has really put this program together, I, I, I think he would appreciate something from what I call our mishpucha. Um, while you are here, we also encourage you to take the time to visit our exhibitions. Um, we have um, three really interesting installations. The main exhibition, of course, is our core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, which is on the main level and the second level. Um, I recommend it to you very highly. Um, there's also Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust on the third floor, photo gallery exhibition. Um, and uh, Survivors is a photography exhibition made by Martin Scholler, who will be on our next panel here at 11.30. Um, also, get Andy Goldsworthy's Garden of Stones, the installation in the second floor, is worth a visit. That's just outside our wonderful Cafe Lox, which will be serving food all day long. And the whole museum is open to you today, so I hope you'll take advantage of it. <laughs> also, in my commercial message, you can pick up holiday gifts and books at the Pickman uh, Music Shop and Visitor Services on the main level. We're encouraging people to wear masks in the afternoon, and we hope you'll share feedback with us in our post-festival survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. Um, this program, uh, and all the programs that are made possible in part by uh, the Battery Park City Authority support, your donations also help us preserve these programs. Now let me introduce our speakers. Daniel Gross is one of the most uh, widely read writers on finance, economics, and business history. Um, Mr. Gross report worked as a reporter at the New Republic at Bloomberg News. He wrote the Economic View column at the New York Times and served as Slate's Moneybox columnist. At some point, he will work for a recognizable media company, but it's a very good start, Daniel, I would say. Um, he's the author of eight books, including this one. Jonathan Goldberg is known as the uh, United Kingdom's leading trial advocate and defender. Uh, Goldberg makes frequent television appearances on CNN, Al Jazeera, Sky, and ITV, commenting on issues of legal interest for several years. He writes, he wrote a column in the Jewish Chronicle entitled, Ask the QC. He is a recipient, a very rare two-time recipient of the Times of London Lawyer of the Week Awards. A Banker's Journey, How Edmund J. Safra Built a Global Financial Empire is available for purchase in our lobby. And Daniel Gross will sign copies after the event. Please welcome Daniel Gross and Jake John John Jonathan Goldberg. Well, thank you, Jack, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here this morning. And it's a great honor to be interviewing Daniel Gross, who's written this absolutely fabulous book. And you can see I've got my own copy, and it's very heavily marked, let me tell you. And I'm going to begin. Um, by the quotation which is in the uh, frontispiece of the book, 
where um, Arthur Levitt, a chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission here, a very distinguished chairman in the uh, late 90s, he described Edmund Safra, and after all, we're in the theater named after him, in the museum situated in the plaza named after him. And as you know, there's hardly a great city in the world today where there's not some magnificent uh, building that remembers his legacy. So he was described by Arthur Levitt as the greatest banker of the 20th century. And of course, he built up a fortune of $3 billion. That was the value of his estate when he prematurely died, really murdered at the age of just 67. So I'm going to, to ask Daniel firstly to explain to us uh, why that is so. Why was he the greatest banker of the 20th century? But secondly, he was very much a Jewish banker. There was something very specially Jewish about Edmund Safra. So tell us, please, about that also. Uh, I will happily do so, and I thank you for the introduction and thank all of you for coming here. Um, you know, on the one hand, you would say, well, there's, given the financial crisis and what happened in 2008, that there's probably not that much competition as far as being a, even a good banker uh, in the late 20th century. Um, but Edmund Safra's story was unique. He was born into a multi-generational banking family. So his father had a small bank in Beirut, Beirut a tiny bank. He sent him uh, to Milan at the age of 15 to start finding a beachhead for the family in 1947. And over the next 50 years, he set up a financial institution in Brazil that his brothers built into one of the biggest Brazilian banks. He founded a private bank, TDB, in Geneva in the 50s. He founded Republic Bank in New York as a startup with about five or $10 million that grew almost organically into the 11th largest bank in the US. He sold his first private bank and he started another one in 1988 called Safra Republic. So founded four banks on three different continents, continued to run his father's bank in Lebanon as a Jewish person through the Civil War through the various occupations, through the Syrian occupation. He owned it at the time of his death. Uh, the stocks of his banks, which were public, uh, had about a 20, 25% compounded annual return, and he almost never had a credit loss. You put the combination of things together, managing a legacy operation, founding bank after bank after bank, and running them to a very high level of efficiency in a period where there were all these booms, busts, and bailouts, and I think that's sort of the case on the, the banking side for him being one of the greatest bankers of the 20th century and perhaps the best of the second half of the 20th century for sure. And tell us something about his particular Jewishness because um, you tell us in the book how he laid to fill in every day of his life, how the dining room in his banks were kosher for the clients to eat there. Um, he was very proudly Jewish and, and how did that square? with managing to be so successful? So, <clears throat> I guess I would argue it wasn't just that he was Jewish, it was the particular type of Jew that he was, which is to say, a Syrian Jew. And I just want to very briefly, sort of my entree into this and what I think enabled me to tell this story. Um, I spent 30 years covering uh, sort of the financial world on a global basis at the highest levels. I went to Davos every year. I've interviewed pretty much every CEO. I have the tools to put together a narrative about a uh, 20th century banking empire. Um, while my name is Gross, my father's Ashkenazi, my uh, family is really my mother's family, um, and we are Dwecks and Nassers from Brooklyn and from Aleppo. And the slide I like to show is that if you had a Venn diagram of people who are capable of writing fantastic, sweeping narratives about 20th century global finance and people who are Syrian Jews whose great-grandparents came from Aleppo, it's a very small <laughs> overlap. It's, it's, a, it's a much younger version of me. Um, and I think that's what gave me sort of entree into the story, but also uh, teasing out all these details. So it wasn't just that he was a Jew, which was important, that he took it very seriously. But it was where he came from, and where he came from was Aleppo. This is the great synagogue of Aleppo, one of the oldest continuous Jewish um, communities. It's referenced in the Bible as Aram Tzovah. 
The cornerstone of the great synagogue pictured here dates from the 300s. Um, this is a very cohesive, interesting, um, proud community. And the Safras were among its leading members in the you know, 19th century. They were known for being bankers then. And it's his, um, the connection between who you were as a person and what your profession was because your name was often your profession in that world, and you inherit every business was a family business, and his sense of responsibility to that community, both in Aleppo and Beirut and in its diaspora, uh, that kind of informed his view of what banking was. And the view was you have to take care of your depositors because there's no such thing as deposit insurance. You have to manage for the long term because every business is a multi-generational uh, uh, business, and you have to be concerned about your name because your name is what gives you credibility. There, was no, there were no shareholders to lean on, there were no regulators to lean on. Your name was your honor. And these Halabi Jews, as you call yourselves, and as you say, a very proud and ancient community, but you absolutely got everywhere, didn't you? I remember as a kid growing up in Manchester, the important cotton town in the north of England, or at least it was then. Sadly, the cotton trade no longer is there. But um, there were many very famous uh, Sephardi families, absolutely prominent in commerce and cotton, all of whom came from Aleppo, as yes. you say. So many of my friends were Shwakis and Tawils and Dweks and so forth. But um, coming back to Edmund, you've got a wonderful photo when he was 15. Oops, I'll, I'll get to it. We'll right. get to it. And the amazing thing about this photo, when I showed it to my wife this morning, I said, how old is this man? She said, at least 40. Yes. Yes. You yes. see what I mean? Now, at 15, and I'm going to ask you to tell us a little more about this, um, Daniel, you describe in your wonderful book how his father, Jacob, a small banker at the time in Beirut, uh, but a a famous banker nonetheless in the commerce of that city, then an international city, a French city, you describe how he sent young Edmund at the age of 15 to Milan, and this was in 1947, Italy absolutely um, on its knees just after the Second World War. And I think it's right to say that by the next year, he'd made a mere $40 million dollars for his father's bank. Now, how on earth did this happen? And, and tell us more about it. Yeah, well, just briefly, you, you mentioned Jacob Safra, which is his father, uh, who is a very established person in uh, Beirut. He had, he had moved there from Aleppo, 1920, built a bank. Uh, this is a photo from the 50s. In the center is the chief rabbi of Beirut. In the left is Pierre Jamal, the, one of the founders of the Phalangist Party. And there with the sort of tarbouche on the right, that's Jacob Safra, that's Edmund's father. This is the Safra family, Jacob Safra, his wife, and six of what would ultimately be their nine kids. And Edmund is on the left. Oops, those are the Safra. And here he is at the age of 15. So, you know, in that world, um, we talk about the book is a, uh, is a story of empires and networks. So they start off in the Ottoman Empire. It falls apart. That's why they're starting to look to Europe. Edmund was born into these networks. There was the networks of the Halabis. Um, there was the network of Jewish bankers. They were already doing business with the Mokadas and the Rothschilds in the 20s and the 30s, uh, and the um, network of the schools that he went to, the Allianz. Uh, these were a network of French-speaking Jewish schools that stretched from Morocco to Iran. They would bring people, train them in Paris, and then send them out and, and educate kids in sort of modern subjects um, in these communities. You finished school at the age of 14 or 15 and went to work. Um, Edmund was going around with his father at the age of nine or 10 to the market, talking to merchants. He would send them around back to see how many bolts of cotton they had or to make sure what they said they, they had. Um, in that world, your oldest son would typically carry on the family business. Edmund had an older brother, Ellie, who was seven or eight years older than him, um, but by the late 40s kind of wanted to do his own thing. Edmund I, uh, was identified by his father as being a prodigy, as being a savant. Whatever one needed to succeed in business, he felt that Edmund had it. So in 1947, things are basically okay in Beirut. Uh, Lebanon was the one Arab country where the Jewish population actually increases after the founding of the State of Israel because a lot of people from Syria came there. But 
he could sense that they needed a beachhead somewhere else, that the old world of trading within what was the old Ottoman Empire, of Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, Turkey, was no longer really a thing. He needed a beachhead somewhere else and to look ahead. So he said, Edmund, you're going to Milan. Um, he didn't send him alone. He sent him with a chaperone who was 19. <laughs> but, you know, you were forced to kind of grow up early uh, in this world. And somehow he knew how to conduct himself. There was a group of Syrian businessmen in Milan who were people in the textile trade and the financial trade. He had a large bank account waiting for him. And essentially what he did was buy gold. Um, in Europe at the time, the price of gold was fixed. It had been fixed at the end of World War II at $35 an ounce. There's no point in trading it. That was, the, that was the price of gold. It did not trade freely. The London gold market was closed. The Safra's like, oldest business was moving gold in camel caravans from Turkey to Kuwait. Um, now they got airplanes. Edmund buys gold, sends it to his father in Beirut. They put, send one of their brother, brothers-in-law to Hong Kong, where gold trades freely, where smugglers want it, where people want it as a store of value. There's a civil war going on there. And so he shows up in Zurich in Paris, in Amsterdam, at the age of 16, 17, 18, saying, I'm buying gold for my father, putting it on planes, and sending it on to the Middle East. He, would, he was also doing you know, foreign exchange. He was somehow involved with financing films that Errol Flynn was making. Um, just, again, all at the age of 18, 19. And of course, as you say, he had the great advantage, unlike you and I, of not going to university. <laughs> so he had to make a living for himself. Uh, he spoke six languages, did he not? Yeah, over time he came to learn uh, six or seven languages. Of course, if you lived in um, Beirut and went to the Allianz School, by definition you knew Arabic, French, and English. He picked up Italian very easily, uh, and then later Portuguese when he went to Brazil, Spanish, and some German. And you describe how there was this tremendous trade going on between the Jewish businessmen of Beirut, his father, his family, and Arabs in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia. There seems to have been uh, no barrier when it came to trade in those days. Am I right? Yeah, well, you know, they used to say uh, of Beirut and Lebanon that it was, a, it was a place that put deals before ideals. Um, I, again, I showed the picture before of Muslim, Jewish, Christian leaders Lebanon in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s was a kind of special place in that world where there was a, an entente where the you know, prime minister would be a Muslim, the president would be a Christian, you had Druze, you had Jews, they were all part of the establishment. At Passover every year in the Jewish quarter, they would kind of block off the streets and dignitaries from all the other sects would come and show their respect. It was that kind of world. And then when the Gulf started to get money in the 40s, that was the financial center. It's where people from the Gulf came to you know, go to casinos for nightlife. And so it was really this kind of bridge between Europe and the Middle East. And if you were a financial intermediary, which is what we describe bankers as, you could do business with all these people. And it was not, what your religion was, was not a barrier. Please God, we may be getting back to something like that with the Abraham Accords, who knows. Um, so with this great advantage of being able to move seamlessly in the Arab world as well, uh, once Israel came about, I get the impression from your book that he had to be very careful not to advertise his links with Israel. And in fact, um, you describe how he first visited Israel as late as 1980. That's right. And I've just come back. I was in um, on a sort of tour of, of a bit. Uh, we were in... England, we were in France, and then I went to Israel. And some of the questions I got there, and, and any time a Jewish person goes to Israel, the first question is, why don't you live here already, and why aren't you moving here? It's not, it's great that you came. And so that was a, a question that I had to sort of look back at. Um, when he went to Milan, he didn't leave from Beirut, he went from Lod, which is where Ben Gurion Airport is, so he drove across what was then a border. This was the fall of 1947, so Israel had not yet been fully declared uh, because the, the, the flight that left from uh, Beirut to Milan was on Shabbat. He didn't travel on Shabbat, so he drove to what was then Palestine, to you know, the, the airport there, and left. Uh, he would not come back to Israel until 1980. Um, and it, at some level, it seems strange because so many Jews from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt came to Israel when it was formed. 
the Safras were bankers. Israel was a very poor socialist country. They didn't see much business to be done there. As you note, they were already doing a lot of business uh, in the Arab world. Uh, and if you go back and think about the 1950s and the 60s, there were blacklists. So if you were a a company that did business with Israel, you would get put on a blacklist by Syria, by Saudi Arabia, by Kuwait, et cetera. And a lot of his business in Brazil, which you know, we can get to in a bit, was dealing with people who had moved uh, from Lebanon, Christians, Muslims alike. Um, and so in these somewhat poignant letters, he was, as early as the 50s, supporting institutions in Israel the tomb of Rabbi Meir Balhanes in Tiberias, orphanages, synagogues, things he was naming after his father, but he was always sending the money through somebody in New York. He would never send anything directly. And there's letters I found that say, you know, Edmund, he can't correspond directly with people in Israel because of this fear about the blacklist. And we weren't, wouldn't look at um, business deals. And there was a second reason was that as the 50s, 60s, 70s go on, uh, the communities, Jewish communities in Aleppo and Beirut start to become under greater pressure. They're leaving, they're being persecuted, and he, uh, the institutions that supported so many of the activities in those communities kind of implode as people leave. And essentially, in the diaspora, Edmund set himself up as a kind of one-person institution to help keep these communities afloat, sending prayer books, sending money, uh, intervening with politicians. He maintained this bank in Beirut in part because that's where all the Jews in Beirut kept their money. And if they needed to get out, he would help them. And so at some level, he also feared that if he was too publicly identified with Israel, that something bad would happen to the Jews in Aleppo, in Damascus, in Beirut. Yes. And you describe the really remarkable relationship he had with his father, Jacob, and so many of his incredible philanthrop philanthropic institutions all over the world bear his father's name, don't they? Not his name. Yeah, you know, you had mentioned, we're sitting here in Edmund Safra Hall, and you had mentioned how, you know, anywhere you go in the world, you will see an Edmund Safra building. In Edmund Safra's lifetime, you would never see anything with his name on it. In his world, in that culture, you do not put your own name on buildings in your lifetime. You give things in the honor of your family, of your mother and your father, and that is how it's done. And so, his father is Jacob Safra, you will find uh, synagogues, Beit Yaakov, Kol Yaakov, Ohel Yaakov, uh, the Parat Yosef Yeshiva, which is the big Sephardic uh, Yeshiva that overlooks the, the Western Wall. There's a big sign there that says Beit Midrash Yaakov Safra that he gave. So uh, if he would give prayer books to the synagogue in Milan, he would say, this has to be inscribed with my mother's name. That's what he did in his own lifetime. And you describe how anyone who ever asked him for tzedakah, for charity, was never turned away empty-handed. Yeah, uh, I'm going to run through a bunch of things because I want to show please you. Please do, yes. Two particular components of this. This is a, well, I'll do this one first. This is a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So Edmund Safra loved donating money to synagogues. If you were a Sephardic group, uh, you know, in 1974, when the first synagogue in Spain since the Inquisition is being built, they ask him and he helps build it, it's called Beit Yaakov. If there were a group of Egyptians in Brooklyn who had fled and were looking, they needed a, a guarantee on a loan, they would come to Edmund Safra. Uh, in 1971, he gave not one but two Torahs to Shad uh, Zion. Shad Zion is one of the big Syrian synagogues in Brooklyn. And this is a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, which he signs, you know, Menachem Schneerson, and he did some little edits on the side, which is saying, you know, why it's a, a particularly large mitzvah to give two Torahs. This is a note, this is in French from 1979. It's signed Le Rabbin de Alep, the rabbis of Aleppo. There was still a community that was holding on there. And the subject of this letter is that the chief rabbi, whose name is Yadid uh, Yom Tov, who ultimately came to uh, Brooklyn in the 80s, uh, he's suffering. He's in bad health. He's in financial trouble. Can you help? And it's signed in you know, sort of pen and pencil by the seven remaining rabbis who are there. And at the top, you can see it says a green marker, $7,500. Um, at our book launch in Westport uh, two months ago, the woman who was Edmund's assistant, her name is Danielle Pinay, came up to me afterwards and says, that's my handwriting. <laughs> so this is part of her day, like every day, was fielding these types of requests. He felt it was sort of bad luck, especially to refuse a request from a rabbi. And he used to quote his father in two particular respects that I found very interesting. Um, his father used to say, make a dollar a day, but make sure you make a dollar every day. Yes. 
That was one quotation I remembered. And another was his father's um, giving such vital importance to protecting the deposits that the purpose of a banker is to protect his client's funds. If only that were yes. always observed these days. But that was very yeah. much his watchword, wasn't it? Yeah, so I think he had a very like upside down view of banking compared to how it's practiced here. And this is one of the reasons people could never really understand how his banks made money, even though his banks were publicly held and they reported their earnings every quarter. And this is traced directly back to Aleppo and Beirut and being a kind of leader of the Jewish community. Because the greatest embarrassment for him would be able to not meet someone's demands for their deposits. Um, in his world, there was no federal deposit insurance company, corporation, that offered deposit insurance. There was no central bank. He believed that even in the U.S., where we had this big regulatory regime, that if push came to shove, they wouldn't help this Jewish guy from Lebanon out. So number one, you protect your depositors. And that means you don't take too many risks. You don't lend money uh, recklessly. You don't lend money to people you don't know. Like, mm -hmm. as a banker, he actually, you know, in the banking world, a deposit is a liability and a loan is an asset. And he saw it precisely the opposite way. He loved taking on people's deposits because he could find things to do with them. And he didn't like making loans to individuals. So his bank in New York, Republic Bank, which was a consumer facing bank, it didn't do credit cards, it didn't do car loans, it didn't do mortgages. He would take the deposits of people from Brooklyn and Queens and use his network and lend $50 million to the Central Bank of the Philippines, to government agencies that in those days would not default on loans, to loans that were guaranteed by the Export Import Bank or the World Bank or the IMF. They may have a lower uh, interest rate, but he wouldn't have to lose sleep about them getting paid back. And his point about making a dollar a day, um, even though he was working in a world before algorithms and Excel and spreadsheets, hedging and arbitrage was a natural thing that he did. It came naturally to him. It's what um, you did in that world. One of the earliest examples in the uh, 40s and 50s, there were these still these gold coins from the Habsburg Empire. And some of them had the face of Marie, Empress Maria, and some of them had the face of Franz Josef. These were gold coins that had the same value. But in the Arab world, a coin with the face of a woman had slightly less value. So he went around and they bought the coins in Lebanon with Maria's image, brought them to Europe and swapped them for the ones with Joseph's image and sent them back. There was no way you could lose money. And so he was always looking for banking activities in which you could not lose money. Yes, and that's another of, the, of his quotes um, when he said, never give a loan that you can't afford to lose if it goes wrong. Yes. Yes, and another of his wonderful quotes, because you, there are so many in your book, and I love this one most, I think, that when his executives, when he started the Republic National Bank, and they said, give credit cards, and he said, my clients want green cards, not credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, a green card is something it took him an awful long time to get himself. He used to have to leave New York regularly because he couldn't stay for more than three months at a time, like any tourist. Oh, no. is, is that right? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm... Yeah, I want to show you his passport. So he was a Lebanese citizen. In 1954, you know, he's going around Europe. In 1952, the family's apartment is ransacked. There's a bomb at the Alliance School. The staffers are like, we have to leave yep. now. Um, you couldn't just pick up and move to Europe and become a citizen. The US immigration rules at the time were not hospitable. And so he decides at the age of 22, we're going to Brazil. There were 40 or 50 Syrian Jews there. It was not quite an open economy, but it was a developing one. And so he moves the family to Brazil, and there he instantly starts trading. He's trading coffee with a guy in, in New York. He's buying uh, surplus uh, army ships and sending them to Italy where they're scrapped. They get involved in the manufacture of jute bag, the, the bags that coffee goes in. They're bartering um, with Hungary for uh, you know, industrial equipment and sending soybeans. 
because um, as a citizen, he was not allowed to open a bank. He finally gets his Brazilian citizenship. This is his passport from the early 60s. Again, he was 31, 32 years old, completely bald, looks 20 years older. And it says profession at the top, professor comerciante, which means merchant. So he was not seen in Brazil quite as a banker. I get the impression that this guy was really an absolute genius of a market trader who took his skill into banking. Yeah, well, I think the, it's interesting, the, uh, there were basically two kind of Jewish banks in Beirut. Uh, one was the Safras and the Zilchas. The Zilchas had come from Iraq and set up shop there. They were somewhat older family. And in one of the interviews that I had, uh, and I should note that Part of what enabled me to put this book together was in the years after his death in 1999, uh, people had conducted interviews with hundreds of people who knew him, from his childhood in Beirut to people like Jacob Rothschild or Henry Kravis and industrial magnates, et cetera. And in this interview, Ezra Zilka, who was a, himself a well-known banker, you know, referred to Jacob Safra's bank as a accounting house down by the harbor. In other words, they, they didn't, in the 20th century, they was not like a real bank where you, they did all the banking activities. It was you went there, you changed money, he would lend you some money against your harvest or against your, you know, your sheep coming down, or you had a shipment of cloth coming in from Manchester. It wasn't a bank in the sense that we would think of banks. Yes. Ultimately, they did transform that in the 50s into a common stock company, and they were, it was always very sad that uh, Jacob Saffer's bank, which became called Banque de Credit National, BCN, which still exists to this day, in Beirut, and on its website, it notes that it was founded by Jacob Safra, um, and it was number 36 on the list of Lebanese banks, and they always had that on their stationery as this like real sort of point of pride that it was a, a, an actual real incorporated bank in Lebanon. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about him personally. Uh, he didn't marry until he was 43 when he married the famous Lily, and I'll ask you more about that in a moment. Uh, but he was a great ladies' man, of course. Good luck to him. He could afford to be. And um, uh, he was a very superstitious man also, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to find... That's Teddy Kolek with him there. Yeah. Uh, uh. Just going back up. You know, he was a man of who felt great obligations to his community, to his family. Uh, but there was an area in which he didn't adhere to the sort of norms, and that was if you were a Syrian guy at, in your late 20s, you got married to an 18-year-old Syrian woman and proceeded to have five or six children. So you could have boys, never girls, boys who could go into the business and take it over from you. He spent his 20s and his 30s traveling around the world. He was peripatetic. So he said he went to Brazil, he sets his family up there, sets his brothers up, he goes to Geneva, starts a bank there, he comes to New York in 1964, starts a bank there, and he's never in one place for more than two or three months. And you know, this is a, a photo from the, uh, one of their annual reports in the late 60s where you see all the dots on the globe where he was building this global financial empire and he was kind of rotating between these poles. So that didn't really, you know, he felt that that was not a, a good setup for someone to have a, a wife and children. Um, well, that was his excuse anyway. That, they could say it was an excuse. You could say, uh, you know, there are perhaps some psychological reasons. You know, his mother had died when he was 10. He had problems, sort of commitment or concerns of being too reliant on somebody who might pass away. You know, there are all sorts of psychological, personal yes. um, reasons. Uh, it, in any event, he, he married Lily Safra in 1976, so he was in his mid-40s. They had first met in 1969. She was a client of the bank. Um, she was wealthier than he was at the time. Her second husband had died. He was the proprietor of the largest uh, sort of like appliance store chain in Brazil. Uh, so she was worth a few hundred million dollars in the late 60s, as it was. Just say uh, that figure again. Probably worth a, probably about 200 million dollars in the late 60s. Ooh, not bad. Um, and they met. They had a long courtship. They didn't get married ultimately until 1976. Yes, and and she was obviously quite a lady. She spoke six languages herself. You describe. She he was her fourth husband, I think. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. 
And uh, as I understand the story, each husband was richer than the one before, pretty much. Well, she was first married when she was 18, as was often the practice. Uh, yes. That marriage didn't last very m many years. Um, Do we have a picture? Yeah, oh, here we are. Yeah. Uh, you know, she, uh, who I, I met her several times, complimented him in many ways. Uh, he enjoyed collecting, um, you know, watches and antique furniture. And she was very much into modern art. So they had these, you know, we're buying in the 70s and 80s incredible art collection that turned out to increase in value many times over. Um, he always, when he moved somewhere, would have a nice apartment in the sort of middle of town. Uh, she sort of expanded her horizons on that front. They, they bought a, a villa in the 80s called La Leopolda in the south of France, which had been owned uh, by the King of Belgium at one point, and it's one of the, now one of the single most valuable properties, uh, real estate properties in the world. But she also sort of moved him into different circles in the becoming a patron of the arts, politics, going to state dinners. He never did that sort of thing when he was uh, a bachelor. And actually, you know, a sort of partner in the business. They said they had this very large global network of clients. Um, and the IMF and the World Bank would have these annual meetings in Washington every two years. And this was like the Safra platform. So they would have a, a party and a reception there, taking over one of the galleries for 3,000 people, ministers, senators, clients, people who worked for them, and she would sort of put this on in, in meticulous detail. So she was a fabulous hostess and complimented him in, in all those ways. What happened, because you've you, you describe their wonderful art collection, every famous artist one has ever heard of just about. What happened to it after, after their deaths? Because it's still she died. there. Yes, where is it? What? W where physically is it? Well, some of it, I just came from Israel, where in the Israel Museum there is the Edmund and Lily Safra fine art wing, so many of the paintings are there, including a, a Richter that she just donated a few years ago. Um, they are in there, you know, he had, has homes in New York, London, Paris, Monaco, and the south of France. Yes. So it's a lot of wall space. Yes. Well, as my wife Regina would put it, she was obviously very good at spending his money. Um, but the one place they didn't have one of these wonderful homes, you've described Monaco, Paris, London, New York, uh, this palace on the south, in the south of France, La Leopolda, but why not Tel Aviv? Well, you know, I, I just came back from Israel a couple of weeks ago, and you can't help but be kind of overwhelmed now by the commercial energy yes. that radiates you know, high-rise buildings, venture capital, Microsoft, finance, I mean, everything that's going on there. And you know, if you go back two years later, you will visit a different country. Yes. Israel was not a particularly dynamic um, economy for the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, he starts coming there. As I mentioned, his, his rabbi from Beirut uh, finally leaves Beirut in the 70s, shows up in Bat Yam, which is just south of Tel Aviv, and Edmund builds him a synagogue there. And there are these uh, letters and correspondence um, from him about, you know, do you really need air conditioning? Like, that level of detail. While he's running these banks, he's writing the rabbi about this. And he comes there in 1980 for the consecration of that synagogue. Um, over time, as the 80s wear on, and the uh, sort of last Jews are leaving Beirut and Syria, he starts to come to Israel more frequently. Um, it's where his brother, older brother, is buried. Uh, it's where um, he ultimately buys a bank. This is the photo on the right is him and his brother in 1991. They bought FIBI, First International Bank of Israel. He becomes good friends with Teddy Kalak, mayor of Jerusalem. And you see there, uh, this is a photo from a, uh, a event for ISEF. It's the Israel Sephardic Education Foundation. It's a foundation he helped start in the 70s to give scholarships to underprivileged Sephardic kids in Israel. So more of his philanthropy, more of his overt, uh, uh, you know, sort of presence. Again, this Parat Yosef, which has the, the name of, of circled in, it's Jacob Saffron on the right, Edmund Saffron on the left. So. He starts to come to Israel more. Um, he's there as a tourist. 
uh, and ultimately starting to do business there. Do you think he felt the pull for Israel that, for example, the great Ashkenazi equivalent family, the Rothschilds did, after all, they were investing in Israel and buying the parliament and God knows what else at a time when there were only orange fields, pretty much. Safra didn't really do that, did he? Well, there is no, you know, we have uh, in Israel, there's like Zichron Yaakov, which I think is named after Jacob Rothschild, right? There are kind of neighborhoods, Montefiore, that are named after some of the great yeah. um, sort of European aristocratic families that... Ashkenazis. Yes, the Europeans, yes. Um, now, if you go to Israel today, you will see the Safra name in many places. The, uh, the square where the municipal buildings of Jerusalem are, it's called Safra Square. So you're starting to see that sort of right. footprint in Nippur. There are many synagogues, uh, donation to Tel Aviv University, uh, hospitals. So the, the imprint is starting to be there. It, it has not taken the form of an entire city. So. Well, that's good to hear. So let me come to perhaps a slightly more controversial question, if I may, Daniel. Um, two of my favorite quotations. One is Honoré de Balzac, the great French novelist, who famously said, behind every great fortune, there is a great crime. And the other is Andrew Marvell, the English poet, who said actually of the execution of King Charles I, he nothing common did nor mean upon that memorable scene. Now the reason I have both these quotations in mind when I read your book is that I see none of that. I see sort of a saint in so many ways. But was he really such a saint? Well. He was a, a human with flaws. He was proud. He had difficulty delegating. He could be a tough and demanding boss. Um, and, you know, I would say there were times when sort of fear got the better of him, where he sort of made trans he was, you know, decided to sell one of his banks, et cetera. Um, and again, I have to say, it's the documentary evidence, uh, and as I said, I've done many events, and I always start off the events by saying, you know, how many people in the audience knew Edmund Safra, how many people, you know, banked with him, how many people knew him from Beirut, and, you know, depending on the audience, like, a lot of people will raise their hands. And after every one of these events, people who have come up to me, people who were not in these interviews, or whose names I didn't find in the documents, who will proceed to tell me a story about how I fled Lebanon in 1973, and he gave me a job here. Um, someone was telling a story that, you know, someone in the Syrian community in New York needed a heart transplant, so this guy was going to call 12 people and ask them for $30,000 each. He called Edmund Safra. He said, don't call the other people. I'll give it all to you. So there's an accumulation of these types of behaviors and, and actions. Um, on the business side, and I think the you know, this is one of the sort of strange features of his life, is that what a lot of people know about Edmund Safra, they know how he died. He died in a suspicious fire in 1999. Uh, Dominic Dunn wrote a sort of conspiracy-minded piece about that in Vanity Fair. And he was attacked in this bizarre episode by American Express in the 1980s. And there's a 500-page book called Vendetta by Brian Burrow. Brian Burrow is the co-author of Barbarians at the Gate, one of the most celebrated uh, business writers of our era. There's a 500-page book written about essentially that one year in his life. So people know how he was attacked. They know how he died. They have really very little clue about how he lived. And the single sort of feature of that way he was attacked is that none of it was true. So the story in a nutshell is he sold his bank in 1982, his Swiss bank, to American Express. American Express is this blue chip corporation. They now think he's going to be like a manager of their branch. They very quickly fall out. He's the, the largest shareholder of American Express. They paid $500 million for it. He leaves. It's clear he has a, a non-compete that he's going to start a new Swiss bank in 1988 and that you know, many of his customers and clients will go to him. Uh, American Express kind of sues and takes legal action in Switzerland trying to sort of stop him from getting a license, but that was groundless. And then in the summer of 1988, articles start to appear in the press in Peru, in France, in Switzerland, seemingly unconnected, saying Edmund Safra's a drug dealer. He's involved with the Medellin cartel. 
he's involved with Iran-Contra, none of which are true. And he instantly thought, he said to one of his colleagues, this is American Express doing this. And they said, you're crazy. Blue chip company doesn't behave like that. He starts suing to get people to retract, and he hires private investigators to kind of unravel this, and two things happen. One is sort of part of discovery. Uh, someone in France turns over the document saying, hey, there's, here's where I got all this information from, that he's a bad guy, and there was a, a fax telltale at the top that said it came from an American Express office. So someone in American Express had faxes to them. Yep. And secondly, this guy who was spreading all this information was a guy named Tony Greco, who had been like a low-level mobster and FBI informant. They follow him from Staten Island. Of course, Tony Greco lives in Staten Island. And they follow him one day, and he goes and meets somebody at American Express for lunch, and they unravel this whole story. And it turns out there were a couple of rogue employees in the PR unit that were running this, funding it. Um, he confronts the CEO of American Express with the evidence. They issue an apology. Instead of suing them, he says, just give $8 million to these two charities. Nonetheless, the first thing many people will say when you say Edmund Safra's name is, oh yeah, wasn't he involved in something fishy with American Express? Um, had I found evidence that he was involved in drug dealing, money laundering, et cetera, I, I would have put it in there. But it was very difficult to find. And he, I think he had a sense that he always had to be above reproach, A, because his name was on the door, B, because as we've discussed, he was responsible for the depositors. But C, he was always an outsider wherever he went. In Brazil, he was Lebanese. In Switzerland, he was Brazilian. Among the Ashkenazi, he was Sephardic. Um, that he felt he had to be above, above reproach. And everywhere he was a Jew. That's right. That, and he said, if, if you know, we have a drug dealer as a client for, you know, for UBS or Swiss Bank, if that story's on page 20. If it's me, it's on page one. was always thus. Let's then come to his very mysterious death. And I think even today you will agree that we, we don't even today know, know all about this. Um, you devote a chapter to it and cutting a very long story short for the benefit of those who have not yet bought and read this wonderful book. Um, but he employed as a nurse, as a general helper, a fellow called Mayer, M-A-H-E-R, not an M-E-I-R, <laughs> by any means, a former Green Beret. And this guy started a fire in order to be able to say, I'm saving you from the fire, what a great guy I am, give me a raise and <laughs> promotion. That's the essence of it. And that's what the court eventually found. But as I understand it, there's a, there's a part of this story that you don't deal with in your book. And that is that Safra had fallen out, apparently, with some very important Russians the year before his death. He'd been to see Putin, and nobody knows what they discussed. He, he was backing Bill Browder, this very famous man, as he is in England particularly, who, who founded the Heritage Fund, a hedge fund based in Russia, and who fell out with the Russians and his lawyer, Magnitsky was famously murdered in prison in Russia. So there was a lot of murky goings on, and, and Safra was somewhere involved in that, was he not? And, and there was the theory that the Russians had killed him, and indeed I think it's right to say he'd been warned by Berezovsky, who was also the victim of an untime, untimely death and suspicious death in England, Safra had been warned, they will kill you for whatever you've done. Um, do you know about that? Why isn't it in the book? So there's a lot to unpack, and I'll yes, a lot build it unpack. from the ground up. So in the 90s, Bill Browder, who you mentioned, who is a, ironically, the grandson of Earl Browder, who was the head of the U.S. Communist Party. So his grandson, Bill, is a Stanford MBA, an investor, says, I'm going to go to Russia in the 90s um, and invest, because there's opportunities. And Edmund, Edmund Safran Republic basically provided him with half of the capital. Browder has since become quite famous. He's written a couple of best-selling books about his experience uh, in Russia. And as you said, Magnitsky, who was his lawyer, was, was killed. So 
Edmund travels to Russia uh, with Browder, and they meet various people. Uh, Republic had a bank uh, operation in uh, Moscow. One of the things they did at the behest of the U.S. Treasury was send dollars on a Delta flight every week to put into the Russian banking system because there was such high demand for dollars, and the U.S. government didn't do that itself. Uh, he had built a big position in, in Russian government bonds, which were paying very high interest rates. But to his point, he said, yeah, these might fall in value, but I'm going to hedge them with a Russian bank in dollars. So if anything goes south, I have that. 1998, there is a financial crisis. Russia essentially walks out on the government debt. And at the same time, the Russian-backed government bank with whom he had the hedges walks out on the hedges. So. Republic suffers a loss of a couple, a couple hundred million dollars on a mark-to-market -market basis, and that's one of the reasons he decides to sell his bank in early 98-99. So there was an issues with Russia, um, investing there, things not working out. At the same time, his health is very poor. He got Parkinson's in the early 90s. He's becoming increasingly debilitated. He has a staff of round-the-clock care. So three or four nurses who were employed by him. Uh, one of them is this guy, Ted Marr, who had been a former uh, US military person who was living there. It was a bit maybe unstable. He was unsure of his place sort of in the household. The other nurses made fun of him. He was concerned about his employment status, living you know, alone in, in Monaco by himself. Edmund Safford was also very security conscious. At his uh, villa in uh, the south of France, there were always eight or nine Israeli security guards, many of them former Israeli military. Um, where he lived in Monaco, which was 20 minutes from there, it was a very secure building, you know, alarm systems, security in the building. So it was actually designed so he could be there without physical security guards because the envelope of the building was so secure, and that's where he was. Um, the story, which is in the book, which is drawn entirely from court testimony, so interviews, confessions, trial, appeals, all the evidence given by Maher himself and all the people who were around there that day is that yes, in fact, he decided he was going to stage an attack and fend it off to pr prove his sort of worth to the household. He stabs himself, he puts sandpaper on his face, he says there's a, an attack, um, he lights a small fire in a waste paper basket to sort of set off the fire alarm so the first responders will come, and then leaves the building. Says, I've been attacked. Upon hearing this, Edmund goes into a sort of dressing room with his nurse and locks himself in. Refuses to come out. They're calling him on the phone saying, it's okay, there's not an attacker. He doesn't believe it. Maybe he's a little paranoid, maybe he's fearful, maybe for some of these precise reasons you describe will not come out of the uh, room, and eventually the fire kind of circulates. The first responders come because of the amount of security at the uh, building. They can't get into the shutters. They can't get up to the building. His own Israeli security guard comes in from the villa in the south of France, and the Monaco police arrest him. because They don't believe he is who he says he is. So it's a chain of events, and he ends up suffocating from the fire. That was what the guy who set the fire admitted to police. It's what was proven in court. It was appealed. To me, that is the story. I have not seen any evidence. Uh, if you read Dominic Dunn's Vanity Fair article, he talks about the fact that there were bullets found in his body. There's no evidence of any of that. That, again, Russia, this guy Maher is served time and has been going around saying that he was, you know, there are all these other things that happened that Again, there is no evidence of. There is security camera footage showing no other people besides Maher present at that place. So, you know, it's natural because it doesn't sound like a very plausible series of events. That's what seems to have happened. Does Browder have anything to say about it? About his death? Yes. Not beyond what, no. Right, so, so Browder isn't suggesting it was no. the Russians. Obviously, um, we remember the man by the wonderful works he did. Tell us a, just a bit about the Safra Foundation, what they've done, and what they're continuing to do right. all so over he, the world. So he, and again, this was another area where I think he 
departed from the norm of his community and Syrian practice. Because, again, in that world, you wouldn't set up a foundation. Your wealth is in your business. Your kids and your family are going to carry on your business. Um, but in 1997, 98, he sets up a foundation. And it says it's going to have sort of three areas of uh, focus. One, medical research, particularly in Parkinson's. Two, education. He's a big believer in higher education. And three, Jewish life. In his lifetime, again, he was supporting the creation of a lot of synagogues, uh, community centers, um, et cetera. So in the years, you know, he, he sold his bank in 1999, took cash for his part of it. Uh, when he died, a large chunk of his assets went to the foundation, which is, you know, professional management, professional investment management, offices in Geneva. They publish a report. You can go on their website and see everything that they support. Um, and over, you know, the last 20 three years, basically, um, with his wife Lily being uh, sort of essentially running it for a lot of this period, mm -hmm. they have deployed the capital that he amassed during his lifetime into, again, um, Parkinson's research. I was at an event in uh, Paris, and two people from the Pasteur Institute, a woman came, you know, they've been supporting the research there for 15 years on the sort of neurological issues surrounding Parkinson's. At the NIH uh, in DC, there is a building for people who are coming to get treatment. NYU has a big uh, Parkinson's program that is uh, yeah. founded, uh, funded by the Safra Foundation. The second area is education. Um, uh, so the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard, uh, endowed professorships, scholarships, uh, and the third is sort of Jewish life. So if you go to Israel now, there are probably two dozen Edmund Safra synagogues. There are Edmund Safra, you know, the big uh, Syrian community center in Brooklyn is the Edmund Safra uh, community center. Ditto for the one in Paris. Um, there is a French uh, translation of the Talmud that has been funded by them, a French chumash that has been funded by them. So it's a pretty broad range of activities. It would be hard to think, I guess, of another couple who've done so much good for the world. One can literally say that. Um, she, of course, died only a couple of months ago. And you met her, but not him, as I understand. That's right, yeah, I met her several times and interviewed her for the book. Yes, in a sentence, because sadly we're coming close to the end of our time, even though we could go on for hours. But in a sentence, what kind of a woman did you find her to be? You know, in, in some ways, again, not having had the opportunity to meet Edmund Safra uh, herself, you know, there's an image, because she was an extremely wealthy woman and an extremely powerful woman that stemmed from that wealth, who had fine possessions, uh, fancy real estate, art, jewelry, etc., which is much the case with Edmund Safra. He was born a rich person and became a even richer person and lived the way that really, really rich people do. Um, coinciding with that is this sense of responsibility to help and assist, to deploy your assets, not just to buy fine wine and fine art and fine jewels, but to sort of, you know, do good in the world and particularly for the communities that are, um, the Jewish communities that are underserved. So I found that she, you know, had very kind of consciously taken upon herself to be the bearer of his legacy. Um, and that a lot of what she was doing and saying was, I believe, what her view of what he would have wanted to be done. And I think that's yeah. what she sort of made her life's work in the years after his death. He never had children of his own, did he? That's right. And, and the last, to me, remarkable feature is that, of course, he was really king of the Sephardis, one can say, without fear of contradiction. And she was an Ashkenazi. Yes. But it was a good marriage. It was a good marriage, but again, this was a, you know, f in the Syrian world, that is seen as an intermarriage. Yes. <laughs> That's the definition of an intermarriage. They sort of sit shiver um, for it, don't And they? it presents certain challenges, for sure. Yes. Well, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our time, Daniel. Um, what can I say to our audience except to recommend that you buy this book, which is a wonderful read. I couldn't put it down. Uh, and you've gained some knowledge now of what it's about. A really extraordinary life, an extraordinary man, and indeed an extraordinary wife. So I do commend it to you. Thank you. And Daniel.
Daniel is going to be signing copies outside now for those of you who want to buy it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you all you. for coming. One more round of applause, Jonathan Goldberg and Daniel Gross.